what does it mean for someone to be a progressive Christian? Sometimes it just means they're a normal Christian who gets a bit woke sometimes. And other times it means that they deny that Jesus is God and don't believe in anything supernatural at all. And Christianity is just a metaphor for social justice. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. In my last episode, I defined, well, not really defined, I just sort of rambled, about what theological, uh, what theological liberalism is. And today, I'm going to be talking about how it's a spectrum, and some churches are definitely more theologically liberal or progressive than others. So, as I always say, um, theological liberalism is not the same as political liberalism, although there's overlap. And a form of theological liberalism called progressive Christianity is what you'll find in a lot of mainline Protestant churches today. I am part of a mainline Protestant church that's a bit theologically liberal, but not nearly as bad as some of the other ones. So I, what I've done is I have just kind of divided, uh, divided it into like five stages, so to speak, of progressive Christianity. And some stages are like, you know, they're a bit liberal, but they're still Christian, and some is like, yeah, they're not Christian at all. They're just um, secular progress progressives um, calling themselves a Christian church. So, um, a brief overview, I basically defined it in the last video, but theological liberalism means you don't really care about the essential beliefs of Christianity, and progressive Christianity means Christianity needs to change and progress. Um, Elisa Childers is a YouTuber who has a lot of resources on progressive Christianity. The only thing is, she mostly talks about progressive Christianity within the context of evangelical Christianity, but I come from a more mainline Christian background. And I, I have, I, I do know about what goes on in evangelical churches, but um, only secondhand. For, I know what goes on in mainline churches firsthand, because that's um, what I've generally been more involved with. Uh, I'm, like, probably the most conservative mainline Protestant that exists in the world. Uh, and it's not to say that mainline Protestants are conservative, they're not. It's just, you know, I'm, as, as far as all Christians go, I'm kind of moderate, slightly conservative, but as far as mainline Protestants go, I'm, like, the most conservative one. Um, I'm certainly the most conservative one theologically in my specific church congregation. I know that for a fact. So, let's go over the five stages. So, stage one is what I would call Christian guilt. If you, if you think Christianity needs to change or progress, um, it's going to start with feeling like there's something wrong with Christianity. So, stage one out of five of progressive Christianity is where you believe all the Christian things, you don't deny any of them, but you feel like Christianity as a whole has sinned. Not just individual Christians have sinned. I don't know a single person who would deny that. I don't know a single person who would deny that there's instances of the church doing bad things. But if you say Christianity as a whole has sinned, has been bad, and needs to change, that is Christian guilt. Um, another, another thing that I think you could identify with this sort of Christian guilt mentality is um, if you... Here's a, here's a thought experiment. If you are not a Christian, if you do not identify as a Christian, and Christianity does not give you, hearing the word Christianity does not give you positive feelings, then you're just a normal person who's not a Christian. You're just a normal non-Christian. If you are a Christian, if you identify as Christian, and the word Christian gives you positive feelings, then congrats, you're a normal Christian. Now, if you call yourself a Christian, but the word Christian gives you negative feelings, if you have negative thoughts associated with the word Christian, you may be a progressive Christian. Um, because the first, the very first stage in progressive Christianity is feeling like there has been something wrong with Christianity historically, and Christianity as a whole might need to change. It could be as simple as the church has been racist, right? Um, and if you 
look at you know specific cases absolutely the church has done racist things and perpetuated racism but if you look at the whole picture the christian religion has been more racially inclusive and done more to end uh racial oppression and like segregation slavery than any other religion by far it's not even close or if you think christianity oppresses women are there some you know fundamentalist circles of christianity where women are oppressed absolutely but historically speaking even in the middle ages we're talking christianity was a woman's religion in fact women are were in large part responsible for the spread of christianity in the roman empire because um even though christianity wasn't some like you know radical feminist thing it was um it was a way for women to legitimately you know uh not be controlled by men be like sort of autonomous beings uh and christianity has always promoted the unity of the family but Christianity has also always promoted the humanity of women, and uh, most other ancient religions and ideologies did not. Um, like in medi medieval times, uh, you know, queens and empresses could have like a lot of political power. Of course, their political power is still connected to men. Um, but you know, think of like you know Queen Elizabeth the First, Catherine the Great. Um, a lot of women having a lot of influence on society. In the arts, there was Hildegard von Bingen, who was probably the... I'm a, you know, scholar, a music student. She's probably the most influential medieval music composer. Uh, compare that to, like, Chinese or Islamic society, where women were just, like, hid away from society because uh, they... And, you know, think about, like, the foot-binding practices in ancient China and stuff. So... Christianity as a whole has been has not practiced injustice any more than anyone else has and has in fact done much more to correct injustice than to propagate it. But, you know, people who are have this Christian guilt will either not know about that or um, just kind of ignore that. So stage two is what I would call a disordered focus. So this means they don't necessarily deny the essentials of the Christian faith, but that's not what they talk about enough. Um, you'll see this a lot in some sort of more woke evangelicals, and honestly, I would say this sometimes applies to my pastor. Now, I've learned a lot from my pastor. He's a brilliant man. Uh, he has he says a lot of things that I think uh, both mainline Christians and evangelical Christians need to hear because he has criticized both at many times. But... Um, sometimes he does focus on the wrong stuff. So, um, Christians who have a disordered focus are likely to sound very woke in a lot of what they say. They're likely to, um, they're, they're likely to focus much more on love and justice than on sin and salvation. They're likely to not focus on theological accuracy, but focus on the church, you know, being loving enough and engaging the world in the right way. So yeah, that's what I would call stage two progressivism. Um, stage two progressive Christianity. Uh, yeah, that it's like it's like a disordered focus where yeah, like it's pretty self-explanatory. The focus is disordered. The focus is not necessarily where it should be. Um, the focus, of course, all these a lot of the things they talk about are things we should be talking about, but. You know, how much do we talk about? You know, the things you talk about show, you know, what is important. And I know different things are important at different time periods, but there are a lot of churches that, you know, only really talk about issues of love and justice and inclusivity, and that's not the most important thing about the Christian faith. Like, I don't know, like, I think a lot of progressive Christians need to hear that God loves you is not the gospel. Um, un unless it's like, the, the gospel is that we are forgiven of our sins, but you can't really have the gospel without the law, and I'm gonna die here, aren't I? Uh, yeah. Actually, wait, 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 yeah. Crap, now I gotta get back. So yeah, um, that's basically stage two. There's a disordered focus, you get the idea. They believe the right things, but they're not focusing on them. Now, stage three is where they start to really deny the essentials of the Christian faith. That's why I call stage three scripture denial. They deny that the scriptures have authority. And at this stage, they're not actually heretical yet. They still would affirm things like the Trinity or the resurrection, but they would deny things that the scriptures blatantly and explicitly say. 
like they people at stage three are basically always you know gay affirming lgbtqia pkwxyz theta affirming um so yeah that and if you bring up that the fact that the scriptures obviously condemn that stuff Sometimes they'll say, they'll give some, you know, weird, silly argument like, oh, the homosexuality the scriptures we're talking about was a different kind of homosexuality than the, it's like, well, yo, um, the only time scripture talks about same-sex relations, it's in a negative light. Scripture has a clear model that, you know, marriage is a man and a woman, Jesus said so himself, deal with it. Now, I'm not coming as, from a perspective of someone who was, brought up in some sheltered evangelical bubble. I was raised in a very progressive culture, but I was raised basic I was basically was raised to support gay marriage. Um, that was what I was always taught to support as a kid. And for the longest time I, I did. I just eventually learned that, you know, if I'm gonna be a Christian I, I can't I can't support that stuff. Um, anyway, but people in stage three progressivism will support that stuff because even though the scripture teaches against it, they will just not care. Because um, they do not hold uh, the Bible to be an authoritative revelation from God. They'll say maybe it contains things that are authoritative, but the Bible as a whole is not authoritative. So, um, in uh, in any given mainline uh, denomination, you'll find I think all five stages of progressivism about evenly dispersed, and something like seventy percent of my denomination, the PCUSA, voted to allow like, um, gay clergy, uh, gay ordination. So that means, um, about 70% of my denomination is about at least stage three progressive. So there's like a 30% of stage one and two. There might be a really small minority of churches that are not progressive at all, but most of those churches have long since left the PCUSA. Now, um, I don't think they should have left because if the reason it got so liberal is because the conservatives left. I talk about that a lot. Most people disagree with me. I don't care. I think I'm right. Deal with it. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, stage three progressivism is basically an explicit denial of the authority, or may maybe it's maybe it's not explicit. Sometimes it's more implicit, but either way, it's a denial of the authority uh, and reliability of the scriptures, and that's a big problem. So like a Roman Catholic church or an evangelical church would never be stage three. It's only really the mainline Protestant churches that are stage three and above in terms of progressivism. Um, and uh, one of the, also another thing in stage three is they're almost usually, they're almost always universalists. Um, the lady who was leader of Christian education at my church and still is, is a universalist. And while she is a true Christian herself, uh, you can be, stage three is the highest stage you can be in and still be a true Christian. Like, I, by a true Christian, I mean you're not damned for being a stage three. I don't mean that what you preach is, like, consistent with historic Christianity. Um, but she is a true Christian. She's a very kind, loving person. But because she was a universalist, she didn't really care about making sure the Sunday school kids were taught well. And they weren't taught well. Like, I know a bunch of kids in my church who went through all the Sunday school program and they were really never taught the essentials of Christianity. They weren't taught against it either, but they ended up not uh, having the essentials of Christianity taught to them and ended up, you know, smoking weed when they got to high school. So, um, yeah, of course, you know, the fact that they don't believe Christianity is m more serious than the fact that they're smoking weed. I'm not some old Baptist lady, but uh, I think the fact that they smoke weed shows that Christianity never really took root in their hearts because it was never really taught to them. Um, yeah, so stage three, you can still be saved if you are a stage three progressive, but your theology will be horrible for your impact on the kingdom of God. Now, stage four, that's where it gets into explicit heresy. If you're a stage four progressive, uh, you're not a Christian. And, uh, I have unfortunately met a lot of pastors still who are in stage four. And my church, when my church was transitioning between pastors, for two years we had a temporary interim pastor. She was only meant to be temporary, but she, yes, she, um, was stage four progressive. So she said explicitly, it doesn't matter whether the resurrection happened historically. Um, she said, obviously the Bible's not the word of God. That's um, uh, a stage three sort of thing. Yeah, but obviously it applies to things that are higher than stage three. Um... I don't know if she would deny the Trinity, but denying the Trinity is part of is part of stage four. 
uh, or saying that Jesus is not God, things like that. Denying the divinity of Christ, denying that Jesus is truly God. And I don't know if, if she denied that. I, I think she, she at least used Trinitarian terms. I don't know if she means the same thing that um, Orthodox, lowercase o, Orthodox Christians mean by that. But um, I, there have been quite a few pastors in the PCUSA that denied the divinity of Christ and, you know, got away with it. They weren't kicked out. Um, the EPC split from what the northern thing that would become the PCUSA after um, one pastor was kicked out for not ordaining women, but another pastor was not kicked out after denying the divinity of Christ. He said something like, well, Jesus, Jesus was one with God, but I too am one with God. Something like stupid like that. So yeah, if you deny the divinity of Christ, you're not a Christian. If you deny the Trinity, you're not a Christian. If you deny the resurrection, like struggling with faith is different than denial. So some people are like, sometimes I have my doubts. That's not the same as denial. So don't worry about that. Okay, finally got back to my stuff. Don't worry about that. I am not talking about you. I'm talking about those who explicitly deny the resurrection and think they're smarter than all those primitive, uneducated Christians who believe in the resurrection. That's who I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, they are not Christians. So how could you get any worse than that? How could you possibly get worse? If, how is this still just stage four? Well, people who are in stage four will deny the resurrection, maybe, deny the Trinity, maybe, but they'll still at least act like there's some spiritual reality out there. Like there's some maybe mystical, supernatural spirit that we can connect with. They're, they're not atheists. Um, they're not hard like materialists. But, um, and th that's why I say my interim pastor was a stage four. Because she really did believe there was something spiritual. Of course, what she believed wasn't Christian spirituality. It was just sort of a... A, a vague um, ecumenical spirituality and of course she was super woke social justice and all that but stage 5 is what I would call essential agnosticism where you really do not affirm anything mystical or supernatural or spiritual at all other than to say that it's a metaphor for something purely you know physical or materialistic um, and unfortunately especially in like Unitarian Universalist churches or UCC churches or the United Church of Canada, there are churches like this. There are pastors like this um, where not only can you deny the essentials of Christianity, but you can literally be an atheist and still be a pastor. So uh, they say, you know, they don't believe God actually exists. They just think, you know, how can the idea of God inspire us to do social justice and how can we look at um religions throughout history and how sometimes they inspire people to work for the good like um and this is something that applies to all forms of progressive christians a lot of times they're theologically liberal which is rooted in postmodernism these days which says that truth is subjective and they would say that applies to religious truth. So they may say things that sound like they believe in God when they actually don't. So they'll talk about God as if God is a real thing. So you'll be like, okay, cool, they believe in God. But they believe, oh, God exists like subjectively, like in our minds, not in reality, not as the actual real objective source of all existence, the way historic Christianity has said. So yeah, there like like I said, there's a big difference between um, historic Christianity and how a lot of progressive Christians talk. So whenever I tell people about progressive Christianity, people who are not super familiar with it, people who might have uh, grown up in it, either an evangelical church or it's not just that. It's even like atheists I talk to are really confused about this. Like the thing I've been able to agree with most atheists on is that you know church for atheists is kind of stupid. It's like there's no point to it. But um, I do know the reason why they, why pastors like this continue to be pastors, and it's not a good one. So there's a different, I'd say there's a difference in the reasons pastors stay pastors and the reason that, you know, the individual lay people, the congregants stay there. The congregants usually stay there in progressive churches most of the time because they grew up in something more conservative 
whether it's Catholic or evangelical or just a more conservative form of Protestant. And they wanted to leave that, but still wanted to feel like they're kind of in a church in Christianity somewhat. So that's like no one converts to progressive Christianity from either atheism or from a, a different religion. They always either were raised that way and stay that way, but even more frequently, they were raised in a more conservative form of Christianity and just want to get away from that, but are basically too wimpy to go full atheist. That's the reality. Now, why do pastors, why would a pastor dedicate their entire life, go to seminary, get a bunch of degrees, and mainline churches do de demand a lot of degrees from their pastors, which is a good thing, in theory, um, but the problem is the seminaries. What, hap what, what happened was the sort of established church institutions in Protestantism, the seminaries, got hijacked by secular people. Um, it's something that happens not just in the seminaries, but in really all academic institutions. They were hijacked by cultural Marxists, and uh, Marxism and secularism is like a virus. It hijacks things that it didn't create in order to produce replicas of itself. So leftists hijacked um, higher education institutions and they reprogrammed those institutions to just churn out more leftists. That's exactly how viruses work. They'll hijack your cells and reprogram your cells to produce more viruses. Um, so leftism can rightly be called a virus. And the same thing happened with secularism. The reason that they are in the church is so they can hijack it from within, and they've been extremely successful. And the conservatives, the ones who have been opposed to them, have not reacted well. For the reason evangelical churches exist is because the conservatives reacted just by running away. They didn't want to confront the problem. They were just like, eh, um, they're starting to invade our churches. We're not going to fight for them. We're not going to take them back. We're just, we're just going to run away. Um, and that's why uh, evangelicalism has a lot of the problems that it does, because it's not really as historically rooted as more traditional Protestantism or as mainline Protestantism. So yeah, those are the five stages of progressivism, and uh, yeah, so not every church that's progressive will be as progressive, but I hope you get a general idea. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you later. Bye!